All good, all good. Uh, now we're here. And uh, sadly, we interrupted you, uh, Richard. Sorry, uh, you were in the middle of, uh, I guess, uh, talking about the um, the side chain and the hook side chain and uh, the decision for, uh, you know, launching. Yeah, there. should I recap what it, where I started from? Or, uh, yeah, please. All right. please okay, yeah. so. Uh, we've been developing Hooks Amendment for XRP Ledger for about three years. Um, it allows you to write custom logic uh, to be installed in, on an account on the ledger. Uh, that logic can control the transactions in and out of the, of the account it's installed on. And it can also emit uh, new transactions and uh, execute uh, custom logic uh, depending on what you want to do with it. Uh, we estimate you can do about 90% of all of the things that you can do with any other smart contract platform for about 10% of the cost to the network. Uh, we went through several iterations of uh, building and, and refining uh, the, the concepts and the code. Uh, and we uh, released in the end uh, three uh, um, versions of the testnet. Uh, we're now currently on version three of the testnet and the code has uh, passed a independent security audit uh, it's a very large amendment, about 15,000 lines of code. And uh, we had originally intended to uh, get it merged into mainnet, but for uh, a variety of reasons and politics uh, that didn't end up happening. And Ripple have expressed their um, uh, preference that new features, big new features like hooks go on sidechains. And they are very vocal about their support of a sidechain um, ecosystem. So they have their EVM sidechain and their CBDC sidechain and so on. And they also have a very large amendment they're trying to get merged into mainnet at the moment that is explicitly for supporting sidechains. Um, so we decided, okay, um, we will put hooks on a sidechain. That's fine with us. So we're hoping to launch our sidechain, hopefully, uh, this year, uh, quarter three sometime. Uh, this is all subject to sign off by legal and so on. And our sidechain won't have an ICO. It doesn't have a new coin or anything like that. It does use mainnet XRP that you have to uh, swap or, or transfer over to our, to the new sidechain um, via a technical mechanism, or you can buy it off somebody who's already done this. Um, so there'll be we expect there'll be a market uh, where you can where you can swap. Uh, I, I think that was that was the, the whole gist of what I was going to say. So uh, I guess we're going to do Q and A, or have we got uh, the agenda up now? Yeah. So uh, actually, thank you pretty much for for that intro here and the recap. Um, what what I had also on the question side is, uh, I guess what many developers are thinking is, um, in 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 practical, how will a developer um, create uh the these hooks um are are there like uh you know libraries or sdks that will be provided i know that there's something like hook script do you want to maybe talk about this a bit for you know how developers will be able to um yeah create these uh hooks yeah so um at the moment hooks are written in c uh, we don't want that to be always the case although if you want to write very efficient hooks um writing them directly in WebAssembly language itself or in C is uh, is probably going to give you the best uh, optimization and therefore the lowest cost to execute. But our intention is that um, there will be a higher level language called hook script that's uh, loosely based on assembly script or TypeScript um, that you can write your hooks in. Uh, as for SDKs and so on, um, well, Vitsa might be able to uh, better answer this uh, question. Yeah, of course. So, um, right. So at the start, there's the the C hooks builder, which we intend to expand to uh, to as Richard mentioned, uh, the assembly script flavor, which is called hook script, which works today. Actually, code is available. It's just not the experience we want just yet for for developers. Uh, it should really be as easy as just using a, a an API a wrapper around all the underlying functions where you can just call uh, a, a, for example transaction properties directly by uh, by, by their property um, I 
think that it will be uh, it, it will be mandatory for a good dev experience if there's a really nice SDK for for JavaScript types, TypeScript to uh, to compile to debug your hooks to test your hooks to upload your hooks to testnet to migrate to LiveNet all those things to have simple APIs simple uh, SDK methods for it it won't be there uh, when when hooks launch it's uh, it's going to be fairly technical if you want to use it at day one. Uh, but this is a call to all developers. Um, yeah. if, if you have ideas about what that should look like, what would be uh, uh, convenient for you, let's have the discussion and let's come up with uh, a spec for what it should do, what it should look like, and then uh, find out if we can uh, work together on or even contract uh, a, a highly skilled company to build it with us. This is great. This is awesome, yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah. So one 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 more thing. If um, I I don't think many people saw it yet. Uh, I will uh, I will tweet about it later uh, after the space, um, because the 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 hook script repository and a couple of sample hooks written in hook script as it exists today is available and it works. And there are build instructions, which means you can uh, build hooks in a TypeScript like syntax. Um, but more and more things will have to be abstracted away into nice methods and, uh, and and functions. What that should look like, we have some ideas. But if if you if, if you feel like joining that discussion, uh, please do. Uh, is Dennis on this call at all? Yes, yes, he is on the call. He's in the audience. And uh, I, Dennis, feel free to come up if you want to speak about it, because I have seen him actually talking with some developers about. Uh, they were asking if they could uh, have something where they can code uh, via Python. Um, I oh, yeah. am here. Yeah, I, I thought, uh, Dennis, you might want to share your uh, <coughs> thoughts and experiences on it. I think you are also working on an independent SDK. Yeah, so um, originally Khan had built um, an uh, sort of a client type of uh code base that basically built the code or built the hook and then was able to deploy it in sort of a client application setting we then took that and created a a full testing library um we can we have 20 or so hooks now uh very simple functions and then um very more complicated the the ones that uh or there's a there's a series that will be launched originally, um, and those are in there under under audited, and that is an entire testing library that we actually use with a with um, a standalone Docker, and we're able to to test that library, and then what our plans are is to create an SDK out of that because it's already tested all the functionalities tested. So I've got it down to maybe one or two functionalities with then adding in your parameters and your grants. So that is the outlook on TypeScript. And then I do think the, the port over to Python should not be that difficult. Um, and hopefully we can uh, get something like that going. I don't know, you know, exactly if that'll be around the day that it's launched or not but um as soon as the repo is public we will open up this yeah so there, there's some there's some nice tooling that uh, dennis has been uh, building as he's been testing um he, dennis is running uh, quality assurance uh, on a, on um uh sort of the what we call the production hooks. These are going to be the uh, the hooks you can install on in your account uh, when the sidechain launches. Um, they are written by uh, us and uh, um, pre-audited and pre-tested, so you can have something immediately working out of the, out of the box. Yeah, awesome. Uh, before we jump into the questions, and feel free in the audience um, to can I jump. To yeah. In real quick there, because um, while I was managing some things in the background, um, I, I'm not sure if I missed that. And I just want to have. No, no, no. So okay, so, yeah. So my 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 key. Well, my quick question is: um, there will be some security measurements in order for hooks being verified or audited in some capacity. Can you can you say one or two sentences about that? From my side, or from uh, from an SDK point of view, I don't think we're focusing 
our goals uh, necessarily on security. If if you want to open up a pull request and put your C hook in there, I will review it or we can work something out like that. The library allows you to create and set up a, a series of transactions to test your hook. So to, to be able to test it from this account, from that account, with this transaction, with that one. As far as security goes or or a process like that, I think VT actually plans to have sort of a hook store or, or maybe you want to elaborate on, on sort of maybe that flow. Yeah, definitely. Um, so if, if you look at the smart contract world today, uh, people interact with a range of contracts on, uh, uh, for example, what they, what they call a Web3 website, just a normal website, and it, it interacts with, uh, uh, oh, uh, with, with a blockchain and smart contracts there. But if you look at what the signing process looks like for end users, it's, uh, it's not, not really convenient. So uh, you interact with a contract, you use a website to set something up, and then you take your, your client, your, 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 your wallet, and then you see a bunch of hashes, and then you decide <laughs> to trust that and sign it. It's, um, you, there, there's a disconnect between the actual interaction with the, with the, with the smart contract and what you can verify in your client is going to happen. So the way we view this from, from XRPL Lab, from, from the sum perspective, is that a interaction with a hook should always, or should preferably be uh, companioned by an X app or a web app. And the two should, should work together, where uh, it's almost uh, like an app store experience where you either install the hook on your account and that will get the X app in your, uh, uh, in your wallet, basically, because it, the wallet sees you have the hook installed, so it shows the UI for that hook, or the other way around, where you open the X app for certain functionality, and then the first thing uh, the X app will offer is installing the hook it is for. And this this user experience really makes it like uh, like Legos on your account. Uh, so you get a, a hook store concept where you say, okay, I want to install the firewall hook uh, to prevent memo spam from coming into my account. I want to install the uh, uh, account protection hook uh, so that if I lose my keys, my family still has access or the notary can recover access or there's a, a deadman switch on my account. Oh, and I want to install the savings hook to automatically uh, save a couple of percent of every uh, uh, asset I can specify that, that, that leaves or enters my account. And these, these installed hooks will be hooks on your account on the ledger, but they will also be accepts displayed in your wallet. And the accept can help with making the things very visible uh, uh, related to that hook. So your settings, what's the savings percentage? What's the block list level? The transactions affected. Uh, so your transaction history, but from the hook context, what did the hook do to this transaction? And uh, I, 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 I don't think we're gonna enforce it, but I think it would make a lot of sense uh, for some and, and other clients to, if they allow you to interact with a certain hook, one, the hook should be trusted, and two, the hook should be accompanied by a proper hook-specific UI. And uh, we're probably not going to be allowed to call it the hook store because Apple and Google will have their <laughs> opinion about that. But uh, but yeah, that's that's the direction we're taking. I mean, that sounds massive, right? And compared to, yeah. to smart contracts, people are interacting with all the time and then having their wallet drained because they don't understand what's really happening and, and no one... Um, looks at code, so this is a massive advantage um, to the stuff we're having right now across the, the, way, the industry. By the way, what I just shared is something that's going to be live the day uh, uh, the Hooks network is going live and some is going to be updated to add full hook support. We're, uh, we're going to launch with this concept. So there are going to be a couple of hooks doing the things I just described with a UI, with a shop -like, store-like experience in some. Uh, and I, I hope that's going to uh, raise the bar for, for other uh, uh, contract and accept developers. So um, for, for the audience, feel free to, you know, write questions down there in, in the chat box for Richard uh, Orwitze uh, regarding hooks, because uh, we would redirect this to you guys. Um, but a question that uh, prior to this call, um, I got asked, 
to um, ask either Richard or you know you it would be um, especially regarding this concept with the uh, hook store or basically creating these hooks and um, getting this to users. Um, I mean, we have very recently, by the way, congratulations for the audit for uh, hooks. Uh, I think that was massive and uh, really great to see. Um, but to go with the audit uh, example here, um, how would uh, somebody get his um, you know, own hook uh, app or hook into, into the ZAM or hook store? Um, because you guys would have need to audit this so it's not a malicious hook that people would then install probably, correct? Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, so uh, what we will do, especially at the beginning, is uh, if it's, it's, it's audit these hooks, right? That's, that's uh, I would say, our responsibility as uh, 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 the ones creating the client that everyone uses. Um, only audited, only whitelisted hooks are going to be easy to install. Just one click on your account. If you're a developer or if uh, you're a masochist or whatever, if, if the XRP you own uh, are irrelevant to you, then you can probably enable a, uh, a, a danger a developer mode in some that will allow you to interact with other hooks. Uh, but it comes with warnings uh, and, and dragons and, uh, and more warnings. Uh, because the, the the average user shouldn't do that, um, and and that means that to kickstart this this entire uh, ecosystem, uh, we will have to spend time auditing the hooks, or we will work with third parties, companies, for example, the auditors who looked at uh, at at some end hooks and 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 other things, to see if they uh, want to join this ecosystem by providing uh, uh, auditing capacity, um, and in time I can see. A market actually for uh, for, for the bigger for the enterprise for the for the commercial hooks, where there are uh, companies specialized in providing these services. And and to be clear, you can still use uh, um, a direct access to the the new network to install any hook you want on your account. We're not uh, it's not centralized around us. We're not gatekeeping that. It's just if you use our wallet software, then we want to make sure that you're not installing something malicious. Yeah, totally understood, and that's that's great to see. Um, I see there are not uh, not many questions down there. Daniel, do you have a question? Oh, Witze, you want to say something? Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, while we're having this conversation, yeah. I'm. Uh, uh, I'm posting some tweets. So I just posted the hook script example. I'm gonna post some screenshots preview of what the hook store is gonna look like right now on, on my personal Twitter. And I pinned it up here at the top, the one that you just posted seven minutes ago. So if you look at top of these Twitter space, the Jumbotron, what they call, um, you can get directly to the uh, tweet that we posted. And we will keep that up to date. Um, yeah. Daniel, do, do you, do you want to have uh, something for Richard or Witze before we, I guess, um, I want to hear from Scott. Uh, no, that's that's. Um, I mean, I, I probably know a lot of stuff already. I just wanted to um, outline the experience. So I gr I'm, yeah. I'm glad we could share um, how the hooks library. I'm just going to call it hooks library. Otherwise, I will call, call it hook store all the time. Um, like I said, I think that's massive. Um, I'm not aware of anything that works like that. Um, that's that's stepping up the game a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the overall concept is really. Um, if the experience is well, this is what I heard from the de uh, developer community. If the experience is going to be good and they are very um, confident, especially you know with uh, um, salmon or salmon, I should say, uh, should be uh, very very good, then they have no doubt uh, because I guess the experience is really key here. And but I, I guess you know with uh, XRP Labs, that's going to be a great experience for a hook sidechain. Yeah, um, I would go actually over to Scott Chamberlain now, uh, founder of Evernote, very, very interesting. We, uh, we know that um, Evernote has been around for a while. Yeah, it's been around for a while, developing, keeping their heads down, developing and uh, creating something really, really awesome. Um, I, I just want to directly jump into it, Scott. If if you feel feel free to you know talk about it and start 
how, how you got to it and uh, yeah, whatever note is it. Uh, sure. Thanks very much. Firstly, I'm not the founder of Evernote. I'm the co-founder of Evernote. And the other founder is Richard Holland. Um, so awesome. we're, we're very lucky to have uh, such talent in the space because he's responsible for, <laughs> uh, for some of the great stuff going on. Um, Evernode has been um, around since 2018. In 2018, Richard and I demoed a working toy of IXRPL, our self-KYC solution running on the XRP ledger. And that solution relied upon a, a toy version of Hot Pocket, uh, which is the consensus engine that uh, Evernode uses. And since then, it's grown out from Hot Pocket to then some other bits of code we call Sashimono and then finally to Evernode. So um, we, we did that because when I first came on board, as part of Ripple's Ubri University Blockchain Research Initiative, my pitch was all about smart contracts, particularly in the legal space. You say smart contracts do this. Well, let's spec a project and see if it actually can do that and, if possible, come up with a, with a working toy solution. And I was just really lucky that Richard's the guy that put his hand up to help on the coding side. Um, and so we've worked hand in glove in terms of this is what the law allows, but that's not the best tech solution or this is, you know, the, this space is so, um, like the code has to go hand in glove with the law. So it's been a really good working partnership that's resulted in Evernote. Um, and it exists because back in the day, Codius didn't do what we needed it to do. Um, and so we we started again, basically. There's lots of talk I've seen about, you know, Evernote is Codius reborn and all this sort of stuff, and it's not. Um, it exists because <clears throat> Codius is a hosting solution without a consensus engine built into it. What Evernote does is provide the consensus as a service. So as a dev, you don't have to spin up your own consensus mechanism. It, it's provided inside the box of the host um, that you upload your contract to. <clears throat> so basically, Evernote is you start with a Linux machine. On that Linux machine, you put a normal app with inputs and outputs and rules and a state. Um, we have a, a piece of software we call Hot Pocket, which is the consensus. It's a UNL consensus engine that connects multiple instances of that app together. And so now you have a DAP that is running on multiple machines and maintaining a canonical state between all of those instances. And then we said, well, that's fantastic, but we need something that, you know, we, if you have to spin up all of the machines, then this isn't very decentralised. So we developed Sashimono, which is a hosting solution, which um, you run the host and then anybody can upload their DAP into a slot on your host and choose a multiple range of such hosts and together stitch up what is effectively a mini blockchain running multiple instances of their app on multiple machines that run the Sashimono software. And each of the um, each of the apps are inside their own jail that separates them from each other. And then all of those apps are inside a jail that separates them from the machine. And we said, well, that's fantastic, but now we need to know who's who's on the network who are the machines running Evernode code and so we need a registry and that registry could have been a centralized registry um, it could have been uh, any number of things but we decided we wanted it to be an account on the XRP ledger because if we do that we get a decentralized registry it's a, cent it's a centralized point it's it's on one account but it's it's part of a decentralized network. Um, and then the problem became that that account would have multi-sig keys and the people who control those multi-sig keys would effectively be the owners or controllers of the register and therefore the owners and controllers of Evernode. Um, and that's where Hooks comes in. For us, Evernode can't exist without Hooks. We use... Evernote, we need to use hooks to solve three problems. Firstly, uh, we have a hook 
<clears throat> on an account that runs our registry. And so that account automates the process of people um, logging their machine with the registry. They get um, an Evernote, they get a, a registration NFT in return that evidences their membership of the network. And it tracks the, the issuing of that membership and the redemption of that membership. There is a not a stake, it's a deposit that um, hosts must pay in Evers to be a member of the network. And that deposit reduces in size as the network grows and you get your deposit back as that deposit fee reduces. It's a way of ensuring that the early adopters benefit uh, from the technology, which is which is the obverse of what happens. Normally what happens is the, the early adopters are the ones that suffer all the cost and everyone else gets a cheaper product. Well, um, in our model, the early adopters pay never pay any more than the, um, than the latest fee for being registered on the, on the network. Um, the second thing that our hook does is it controls the distribution of Evers. We need our own currency for the Evernode network because there's a fee for registration, there's a fee for hosting. We need that fee to be able to float and find its own place in the market. If we charged fees in XRP, the problem is that XRP fluctuates in price. We would need to track that price somehow. We would need code that updated that price and then we have to work out, well, what is, what is the fair price for someone to register on the Evernode network, what is the fair fee for uh, hosting? And by using our own token, we don't have to worry about that stuff. We can set the price in the token and allow the market to determine the value. Um, what the hook does for us, and I think th this is one of the sexiest things about hooks for me, and it's worth other dev teams, I think, you know, really grokking this fact. Um, without hooks, we would have a honeypot. You would have all your Evers existing in an account. There would be multi-sig keys, that's fair enough, but we've seen plenty of examples where they get compromised and and the account can be drained. Um, and also in the current regulatory environment, you're something of a custodian or a treasury or you've got some sort of liability for being the, the entity that controls the keys and the way in which the Evers are issued. <clears throat> Using hooks, we can give, we put all of the Evers into the hook and they're distributed by the hook according to, you know, mathematical formula from the hook. And now we get a completely um, decentralised treasury. So we've taken what is an issued currency. Evers is a, a currency that's issued on the ledger. It's not native. But by putting it inside a hook... Um, <clears throat> we get something that's counterparty free. It's now emitted according to the, the hook and that's it. Um, and I think there's plenty of projects um, that can benefit from that kind of functionality because for the first time now, it is possible to have a truly decentralised uh, token um, as an issued currency on the XRP ledger, which means there are more business models that you can profitably deploy um, uh, compared to at the moment, the problem is at the moment really you're down to a, a centralised. You, you you issue an IOU, and all kinds of regulatory problems arise from that. We can we can solve that with the with hooks. The third thing that our hook does is it provides the rules for our governance game. <clears throat> all um, validators on the um, so everyone who holds a registration NFT for the Evernote network. Um, can participate in the governance game, which is determines uh, that's simply a capacity to change a hook. And the other thing that it does is um, there's a capacity to vote off dud validators. So there's a bit of social consensus that's necessary. It's, it's um, you know, there are ways in which uh, you could end up with malicious machines that the hook can't detect. Um, and that's that's a bit of social consensus to prune the, the system of dud hosts. Um, and so from out of that network, we get something that's global, that's uh, permissionless in the sense that anyone can run an Evernode host and then anyone can upload a DAP to an Evernode host. Um, and the DAP that you 
um, can deploy in Evernote can do almost anything that you could otherwise do with a, a Linux machine. So it's incredibly flexible. It can store data, perform computations. It can um, connect to other machines or other networks. Um, the sort of thing that it can do really well is if I had a host, sorry, if I had a network of, say, 20, uh, 10 machines and I needed to know what the temperature was in Canberra, I can program my DAP in such a way that, you know, five of those machines are delegated to contact the um, the BOM, the Bureau of Meteorology website, determine what the temperature is, reach a consensus among themselves about that temperature, and then report that back as the canonical truth for the chain. So you get a, a native Oracle um, functionality out of out of Evernode. Um, we are in the final stages. Uh, we're hoping to launch very soon after the sidechain launches. We can't do anything unless Hooks ends up somewhere, whether on a sidechain or on um, mainnet. Um, we are in the final stages of a grant application to Ripple as part of XRPL grants. We have asked money to get our three Hooks audited by the same company that... Um, XRP Labs used to audit uh, the Hooks code itself, so they're probably the best company in the world to, to do that. Uh, we have 109, at last count, 109 um, people running beta nodes on our on our beta net, which has been absolutely fantastic for for testing what we've done, for discovering bugs, both in terms of hosting and in terms of uploading contracts. Um, and so for devs that are out there, part of the, the purpose of the, um, the beta net is to give you a live environment to be able to develop dApps and upload them on the Evernote network. And we're in the process of assisting people to do that. We are an incredibly lean team. Um, it's not an awful lot of funding that we've used to get this launched. It's stuff that I've squirreled away from my research budget as part of University Blockchain Research Initiative from Ripple. Um, and uh, so we, you know, it's not an all bells and whistles singing and dancing team that can do <clears throat> everything that you might do if you'd raise $4 billion in a scammy ICO. But we will launch with, with enough um, of a network that that we can build from there. This is this is really really great, and I just want to give a huge compliment to the Evernote team. Um, I when you know when I go to the GitHub issues and I participated there a lot, you know, recording my feedback and and, and things that I came across. They were super super fast in response and you know solving the issue and. Um, I guess overall, you, you can really see that there is a lot of love in, into the detail here. Uh, I'm very, very excited for it. Um, Scott, uh, I, I really, I really want to also mention that what got me excited is that Evernote is so much more than um, you know just our smart contract platform or layer two, um, because as you mentioned, it's, it's essentially a Linux machine and especially on the discussions around uh, EVM smart contracts. Uh, I think you guys also opened a repository in, um, in GitHub uh, where you showcase that you could do this also with Evernote. You know, you can uh, deploy uh, EVM smart contract there. Uh, very, very easy. And um, have provided, I guess it was an SDK to, to showcase. Uh, Dennis also posted uh, a very, very nice um LMBD SDK, I guess. Uh, very, very cool. And um, so my my question here would be, you know, with the with the current state that you see um, Evernote um, and, you know, what you guys already built so far, do you, what are the most, you know, the biggest challenges, personally, you would say, you, you came across in, in building, you know, this, this layer, this protocol layer, and... Um, yeah, what were your learnings in, in solving them, maybe? Um, I guess there's there's several uh, we've, we've several challenges. One is we've been building Evernote at the same time that 
Richard's been building hooks, and so <laughs> it's it's hard to build something new on top of something else that's being built. Um, and uh, you know that's been it's been lovely that the two you know been able to, to work together um, to make that happen. We've, we're just very fortunate, right? I, I don't think it's a way that anyone else would be would be doing stuff. Um, we learned in the process that uh, we had to do a lot of retooling because we ended up with a hook that was way too expensive. So the good thing about hooks is that it protects its ledger by charging effectively for the size and complexity of the logic that the hook executes. And when you pay your fee, you have to pay your fee based upon everything that the hook might be asked to do, even if you're only asking it to do a tiny little bit of that thing. Um, and that can result in a really large fee to do a very simple thing. Uh, as a consequence, that's how we ended up with three hooks and we've done lots of work to try and minimise uh, the cost of making that happen um, and we've been able to do that and I think that's, you know, it's a big feather in the cap of hooks in the sense that it imposes that discipline on, on people building on the ledger and it, it, it does it does protect the ledger but it does mean that fees for executing a hook are a magnitudes greater than the simple transaction fee that you otherwise get charged on the xrp ledger um the third challenge that we've got at the moment is simply managing expectations within our our budget um you know as i said we're a small team we've got a small amount of money we are trying to build enough that that we have a thing that's there and you know i, I know there are there's lots of nice to haves that it would be lovely to have, and there's there's lots of things that the system won't have that that people think uh, should be there. Um, it's just not possible for the team to make all of that stuff happen and at the same time get the product in in the right shape ready for launch. So there's a there's a bit of that. Um, it's the the real big challenge for Evernote has been explaining it. It's a different architecture. Nothing else like it exists. Um, and, you know, I keep telling the team, look, it, it, we, we have to make it exist in order for it to be explainable. And that means that the growth in Evernote, you know, it'll take a little bit of time. It's, I don't expect it'll just explode overnight in the same way that ChatGPT did. Um, but once it's up and running, I'm, I'm convinced people will see the benefit of it. Yeah, it's uh, evidence yeah. really hard to explain. It, one of the, probably the easiest explanation is it's a meta blockchain. It's a blockchain for launching blockchains. Yeah. yeah and and even like, that yeah. makes people's eyes glaze over, right? So they can't, I, I have to, um, you know, look, as an example, we, we built um, a toy version of what we call Digital Cows, which is a 247365 platform for trading interests in Australian cattle. And the way it works is that um, the stock and station agents who want to be part of the service become a member of the service and run a node. And and they then apply to, the, um, to one or more notaries in the system for roles within the system. You can be a, um, an agent or you can be a farmer or you can be an investor. Um, the cows' data is scanned in. Then each of the cows are put into a herd, a like like for like. So if you've got Herefords of a certain age, you can put them all into a, a vault, a cow vault. And from that vault, you mint tokens that represent a percentage of the sale price of the of the herd. Um, and the stock and station agent is responsible for distributing um, the sale price, the the stock must go through the stock and station agent to reach market. So that's the one of the controls. Effectively, the agent acts as an oracle for the system. Um, there's photos of the cow. When you upload the cow, you can take photos of it. You can do all sorts of stuff so that people can confirm that the cow's real. Um, it's, you know, it's a fantastically sexy little working toy of an app for trading cows. And it runs wholly on um, Hot Pocket, um, and so it's an app on – it feels like you're using an app on your phone. But it's decentralized. There's not a central computer, part right? of it. 
but it, but it's completely decentralized. Um, and one of the benefits of it is that if you tried to run it as a centralized service, there'd be too much too much politics in the Australian beef industry, and one or more of the industry bodies would have to own it and run it. Um, instead, we get a service where if you want to be a member of it, you run a node, and now it's it, the, the politics is removed. We're using the same model now. We've begun a research project using Hot Pocket and Evernode to um, to tokenize Aboriginal art, so that you can confirm the provenance of the art, and then you can track the ownership of it and do automatic payment of royalties back to the artist every time the artwork is sold. Um, and we're looking there at, a, at a potentially incorporating a little bit of AI into the system so that you can scan the art and it can confirm whether it's a legitimate, uh, whether what you're looking at is a, um, you know, is the legitimate version of the art or, is, or some sort of weird copy. That that's all possible because Evernode is just, a, you know, the Evernode DAP is just a decentralised application. So if you do it with, um, if you do it with a normal app, you could do it with Evernode decentralised. And again, for the Aboriginal art community, it's the same deal. If you want to be, if you're a gallery or a um, an Aboriginal um, land council with the resources to run a, a machine. You, anyone, you can join the network by running a node. And, and now we don't have the politics of it having to be owned by one particular land council or it having to be a government initiative or all of that sort of stuff. It's just a service that those who want to participate in the service can help make exist. And I think they're, you know, that's the, the sort of thing that I anticipate really, certainly for me, um, the use cases that I'd be looking at are those examples where I can avoid the politics of a situation by decentralising the service using Evernote? Yeah. I uh, I would like to ask because I I know he uh, he played around a lot with with this technology. We uh, we're discussing the, the, the what Evernote is, and uh, I, I think the perspective from a dev. I would I would like to ask Wojek to explain something about what, what it is to him. How uh, what did you build? Explain a little bit, if you'd like, and, and and what does that effectively mean for you as a dev or for users? Yeah, sure. Uh, I've been on, on Evernote developing it, researching it, talking about it with many people for a year or two now as an independent developer. And right now I'm working on a library on Node.js called DKM, or Decentralized Key Management. And it allows dApps on Evernote, so essentially hot pocket clusters, to manage their own XRP Ledger accounts in a decentralized manner. So uh, right now, the XRP Ledger allows accounts to be multi-sig enabled accounts. So you could integrate in signers, multiple signers, up to 32 now from the previous eight signer entries limit. And those 32 signer entries could represent independent nodes on your cluster, essentially allowing your own hot pocket cluster or Evernote DAP to be its own XRP Ledger account on the on the XRP Ledger, yeah. And right now I'm going to release DKM V 0.2.0 uh, today. I, it has been reviewed by Layton. I was about to, you know, deploy it yesterday, but unfortunately Layton was busy. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I I have to say, you know, because Scott was saying, you know, about um, uh, support and uh, also Richard and, and Scott were talking about how close to explain. I, I just wanted to say, you know, somebody who you, I definitely don't need to explain anything is definitely Bojack because he really figured it out is, and is at the forefront of it. And um, so, Bo Bojack, you know, just to add on, on this with, you know, you said DKM. And by the way, congratulations. I think you won also one of the uh, hackathons, if I'm not correct, if I'm correct. Yeah. Yeah. You got the second place, I guess. Really, really great. Um, so, you know, with um, from an independent, independent developer side, um, what 
uh, would you recommend um, also other developers to look into uh, for developing? Where where do you see or have you seen um, challenges to get in? And what are things where you could say, um, you know, were pretty easy actually to figure out? Yes. So uh, as Richard and Scott has said before in the past, explaining and teaching Evernote to people is quite difficult since the framework that is being used right now by Evernote, the underlying design, uh, there is a marketplace and there's hot, a consensus engine called Hot Pocket. And you need to understand a lot of things as a developer since uh, you're working with uh, consensus, uh, you're working with uh, computational, the computational hardware of your instances on a decentralized network. And a lot needs to be uh, taken into account as a developer. But really, if you're for, uh, looking into Evernote at a uh, first time perspective, I guess, you'd, you'd make most of your time uh, learning about Evernote if you were to look into the consensus side, learning about distributed systems, you know, learning what the XRP ledger is, how Evernote utilizes it, and how the marketplace works hand in hand with Hot Pocket to create a decentralized application atop of Evernote. And I like to think of it as, I like to think Hot Pocket as a engine, a literal car engine, and the hosting marketplace on the, uh, maintained by the XRP Ledger via Hook as the oil, the, uh, the oil that powers the car engine. So uh, again, Hot Pocket instances or Hot Pocket nodes are literally bare bones computers. Uh, you could uh, interact with the RAM, you could interact with the disk space, and you could interact with the processor of the node itself. Great, 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 yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful um, thing. It's not, you know, it's powerful, but it's not magic. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. I, we keep on coming across examples where, you know, in theory stuff that you can do, you can't do. Um, Richard's been through all of this with me repeatedly where you want to use Evernode to do stuff on Evernode but you end up putting a hat on a hat. Consensus is a is a weird thing and you can't use consensus to do consensus. But but it is incredibly more flexible and scalable than any other DAP solution that I'm aware of. And part of the problem with that flexibility is that if you can do almost everything then it's really hard to explain to anyone how they can do anything. Like, I can I can offer an explanation, which is sort of, um, uh, I guess, historical, is kind of how I came up with the Evernote idea in the first place. It's, so the XRP ledger is a decentralized system, yes? Um, and it's a, it has consensus. And But what is it even doing? What's the consensus do? Well, at the heart of it, it just, it's just an accounting app, right? You have XRP, you send it to somebody else, they have XRP. It's just an accounting app that's distributed across lots of computers, that's the XRP ledger. Well, suppose you could just take the accounting app out of the XRP ledger and then put your own app in. That's the idea. So Evernote lets you spin up your own XRP ledger with your own app inside it, basically. <clears throat> yeah, so, that does make sense. Yeah. I want to I want to throw something in real quick that that's um, pushed around Twitter as well, right? And I don't want to make it about like chain politics or something. But how do you see this the hooks and the Evernote combination uh, compared to what Flair's trying to offer us? I uh, to be honest, I don't. I uh, have been a while since I've looked into Flair. I'm not even sure what they're offering. <laughs> so I can really only speak I, speak to hooks and Evernote. I, I think I. I think I can answer this uh, uh, yep. with right. with, <laughs> with a disclaimer that the same goes for me, of course. So what what I what I do know about Flare is that they have built this uh, EVM supporting platform that bridges networks and chains uh, by what what they call this the state connector. They have an Oracle like solution where you have uh, assets and asset prices brought into this one network, Flare. And then if you bring all the different assets from different chains and price information, et cetera, to one platform, then you can use all those assets on in one ecosystem, basically. So they're, uh, they're what, what they call wrapped assets, right? Representation of that, uh, of that asset locked on another chain. 
which means you get assets from all kinds of different chains on one network. And you have pricing information for all of them. And then, uh, uh, well, you can use them all on this one network, which is really focused at, um, at, at the assets, bringing the assets from different networks to one place. If you look at what Evernote, for example, is doing, it's, um, it's, it's like the, 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 the best version of Legos. You get this, you get this, this, this big box and you can build whatever, like come up with it and you can build it and, and you benefit from all the things we like from the blockchain space, right? Single source of truth, uh, uh, clear history, shared states, shared distributed state, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then what what hooks is to the XRPL. It just makes the XRPL composable. It makes it it makes it makes the XRPL uh, do whatever you come up with within the boundaries, of course, of what, what you can do. You can influence behavior before a transaction is applied and after a transaction is applied. But that gives you a canvas to to paint on to to build creative things, to do enterprise things, to be to do compliant things, to do fun things. Uh, all on the ledger we already know and appreciate for having a lot of features natively and being fast, being cheap, being efficient, being very easy to work with. I think all the developers who played with uh, with DXRPL uh, know that like the things DXRPL can do are just really easy to address, well documented. So hooks make DXRPL. Uh, a very interesting platforms uh, platform for all the things you couldn't do on the XRPL, and then Evernote allows you to extend that to anything you'd like to do. So it's not focused on just bringing the assets together on one place. It's focused at building whatever. Yeah, yeah, I, and and I really like the uh, analogy you, you said with um, the Lego. And I think, uh, especially with um, also from from a network perspective, we, we cannot keep adding, you know, uh, one one by one features to the layer one and expand the code base where we have with, um, as a composability and with hooks and, of course, uh, with Evernote, the possibility to do so much more without, um, you know, going to the tedious process, I guess, of adding layer one uh, code changes. Um, I, I want to redirect some questions here we have um, in the chat box, definitely. Uh, I, I guess that would, the first one would go directly also to you maybe, uh, or Richard, um, regarding the Hooks um, sidechain would be, uh, will there be enhanced features and amendments besides Hooks um, on on this sidechain? Um, like, I guess some people were thinking about the AMM or something. Um, but yeah, will there be more enhanced features uh, besides Hooks? On, on the sidechain. Uh, shall I answer this? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, uh, I mean, we don't intend to stop building after it launches. Uh, we're not, we're not going to promise uh, anything, but uh, we, we're looking to have a much more uh, um, fluid uh, turn, feature turnaround cycle than the mainnet has. And we're, we're inviting uh, developers as soon as we launch the chain. To, and, and make the repository public to come um, submit their their amendments. And we're going to, uh, yeah, we, we intend to continue uh, adding features and making making the ledger more feature rich over time. I can I can share some things on on the changes you will actually see on day one when yep. it launches. Um, so uh, for one thing, it won't feature, and now everyone's going to scream and panic. Please don't hear me out. Wait a second before you do. It's not going to feature XLS twenty. Um, because, and I can explain why. There's a perfect technical reason for that. If you if you look at how XLS20 is implemented, it uh, it, it favors uh, using less account reserve, for example, by uh, putting NFTs on pages. So one page contains multiple NFTs. One page has one ownership reserve of two XRP on mainnet today, which is nice from a end user perspective looking at their reserve, but at the same time, it comes with complexity. It comes with complexity for developers because they have to take the, the page logic into account. It comes with some complexity for end users and for tooling on the ledger because you cannot just go to the ledger and say, hey, I have this NFT, who owns it? No, you'll have to have an indexing service running somewhere that says, okay, this NFT is on this page, this page is owned by that user. Now take hooks. Hooks are going to allow people to uh, 
uh, hook into the transaction behavior, right? It can execute before or after a transaction is committed, which means you might want to look up an object like an NFT directly by its hash or owner, uh, which means they should be native objects on the ledger directly owned by the account, not on some page that has to be indexed. Um, so for to, to efficiently work with NFTs, with hooks, they need to be native objects. And uh, one of the other things we're going to see uh, with, with hooks, so th it's a different NFT standard and it's gonna be much, much more compact and easier to work with, but it, it, it's a hard migration if you wanna have your project work on both networks, right? Mainnet and, and the hooks network. Another thing that's gonna change on the hooks network is uh, a, a governance like hook that, that for example, uh, allows accounts to vote on things, not validators per se, uh, which is very interesting and again can be very uh, uh, very transparent to end users as well because it can be in an X app, for example. You can vote in an X app, you can see other votes in an X app. And because it's account based, it can also be nested, right? You can have a nested group of people casting their votes collected into one vote that is part of the network governance. Um, it's probably uh, gonna have lower reserves uh, to make it very easy. As, as, as we mentioned, people are gonna use real mainnet XRP on, on the hooks network, right? It's That's gonna be the asset there you use with. That's what you use as gas to pay, uh, to install your hooks, to execute your hooks, to send your transactions. And we wanna make it a no brainer uh, also for non-crypto users, uh, for retail users to just jump in and use this and developers should be able to abstract this technology away, use it in, in their user-friendly uh, non-Web3 apps from the perspective of the end user and have uh, reserves so low that the developer might just fund all their users' accounts to get started. So there, there will be some changes and when we're looking at uh, uh, new features, uh, versus, uh, for example, amendments currently being developed for XR, uh, for, for and to go live one day on XRPL mainnet. Um, there might be some diversion. Uh, it might might not make sense to activate everything that is activated on mainnet on hooksnet and vice versa, right? But but one thing we will do, the things we build for for the hooks network that's going to be launched. It will be open source. Um, most of it already is open source, and it will be available for PR and uh, amendment on mainnet. So it's it's up to the entire existing ecosystem and everyone who's working with mainnet to decide if the features we are building uh, should have a place on mainnet as well. And I can think of a couple of features that I would love to see go live on mainnet. At the same time, I think it makes sense for all of us to have experience with those features on hooksnet. Uh, before we consider them for mainnet. We also have uh, uh, IOU escrow, um, <clears throat> which Dennis might want to talk about a bit, that's going to be live on the new network. Uh, I, I have a question, though. Uh, could a new, uh, technically speaking, with hooks and its flexibility, could a new NFT standard be created by developers similar to what uh, Ethereum is doing? Uh, make make a new NFT standard using hooks only. Yes, so it's yeah, not native. Uh, yeah, you it could be... you could certainly do that. You could you could write a hook that manages uh, NFTs as a state inside the hook, and then you could have that hook uh, on a black hole account. And then if everybody you know socially agreed that um, a state entry on that hook represents an NFT, um, and you you have mechanisms for uh, transferring ownership of that state entry, essentially inside the hook uh yeah you could certainly do that that would be that would fairly closely mirror the way it's done on ethereum indeed one one thing to add here for those listening not familiar with terminology like state uh when when we mention state so a hook can store arbitrary data on the ledger which is relatively expensive because we shouldn't uh, go about and dumping all our data on a distributed ledger um, it's it's not meant for that, but a hook can install um, can can store arbitrary data like a key value uh, 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 store on the ledger if it pays for it. Which means you can uh, basically do accounting in your hook. You can say, hey, I have a list of 
objects and they're owned by those accounts. Or, hey, I have those accounts and they have those balances within the hook state, within the storage the hook consumes, uh, which means you can track anything and mutate that data based on your own logic in the hook. So, uh, again, blank canvas, Legos, just build whatever you like. There, there, there is also um, here a question for Richard, I guess, in the audience. How many hooks can each account have? Yeah. Is there a limit? Ten. Okay. Is, is this an arbitrary number? Yeah, it's, basically it's basically just, arbitrary. It used to be four, and then we okay. uh, uh, added, added uh, six to it. Uh, the, the hooks execute in a chain, so you get to decide the order of execution. So if you have, um, say, three hooks, then you can decide. Uh, so each hook goes in a slot in, in your account. It's like hook slot zero, hook slot one, and so on, all the way up to nine at the moment. Uh, t okay. Ten seems like a reasonable amount. We we realized that we needed more than four because the, the network launches with four hooks that everybody might want to install and then there's no space for anything else so <laughs> we decided to upgrade it to 10 but an amendment could upgrade it further it uh it's 10 at the moment as uh, yeah it's arbitrary okay and speaking of amendment amendment there's a uh, the question of um how will the network size first be uh, how many validators and how will the uh will there be like a similar voting process or will it be quicker um, than on the mainnet? It will certainly be quicker. I think uh, the code currently is a five-day lock-in period. Um, Vita can speak to the number of validators there will be. The validators on Hooksnet at launch, right? Because so I, what? let me start by saying that we decided that the ideal amount of not per se, so the, um, not per se Governance participants or validators—they're—they're—they're they're, um, they're basically one thing. So there are an idea. There is an ideal amount of 20 governance participants on the new network. Now we don't have 20 at launch, and we also don't want to rush things and just assign those slots to anyone because um, let's let's see what happens. I uh, I think there are places for for really big players, entities, almost. Uh, 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 country level or, or bank level uh, if we're going to do really interesting things on the Hooks network at some point. Let's not rush to give those spots away. But we decided on an ideal amount of 20. If you go lower, you, I would say it's not fully, it's not decentralized enough when it comes to voting and governance. If it's more than 20, uh, it becomes really hard to effect effectively uh, communicate with each other and uh, and decide on the, the best way forward for the entire network. Um, and I, I think we're seeing that today on XRPL mainnet where we have uh, over over 30 validators, but we cannot reach all participants, for example. So it's, it's really hard to make decisions when it comes to voting, installing network updates, stuff like that. And, uh, and, and, and there's always the risk that at some point uh, uh, governance participants, validator operators on, on AUNL become amendment block because they didn't update. We don't want that. I think if we want to uh, 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 get ahead of the, of the game and stay ahead of the game, we should communicate efficiently. So 20. Now, when okay. we launch, we are going to launch with uh, five clear governance participants as in their one entity. And we're going to launch with two pools. Uh, so I, I, before I mentioned the, the, like the nested governance, um, where you have a, a, a first layer of governance, there at the actual accounts, they cast a direct vote. And then uh, you can say it's almost like a signer list, right? You have a signer list of, of participants in one primary level governance group. So one of the 20 could be a signer list with a hook installed, and there can be a default hook, or the group co uh, can can come together and create their own governance hook for their account. Um, and they should collectively also run a validator and contribute to the network. So we identified two pools uh, f for when we launch, which is, of course, a pool of uh, uh, participants uh, on the current mainnet, like developers, projects, uh, who have been supporting the XRPL ecosystem for a long time. And uh, uh, don't call us, we call you. At some point, when we're ready, 
we're just going to have a nice conversation and everyone can decide if they uh, if, if they want to join. So that means that everyone who will cast their vote in that group uh, will uh, get their votes combined into one vote that counts as one of the 20 uh, governance votes. Yeah, so a, a nice way to uh, visualize this is there's a, there's a round table that has 20 seats at it and each seat might be full or vacant and there might be one person sitting at that seat, one entity sitting at that seat. That so each seat gets a vote, um, but there also might be another table of twenty seats sitting at that seat. And so, if there's another, if there's a layer two table there, then the layer two table, all of their seats have to first vote to raise a single vote to the layer one table. That's the way the governance structure works. I see. Yeah, like nested, and that's that's actually really cool. Um, Oh, Wojcik, do you want to go ahead before I pick up a question from the audience? Yeah, so uh, since uh, there are layer one and layer two bod uh, governance bodies, I, uh, I do have a question. Uh, are the transactions that are signed uh, that act as the uh, votes, I guess, uh, from the governed body, are they needed to be uh, signed by the master key or could it be signed by a multi-sig body, so a signer list, essentially? That is you, you, you vote in the governance game uh, using a, a invoke, TT invoke transaction. And uh, the way we envision it happening, so as long as this, the account that's installed on that seat at the layer one table um, raises a TT invoke, then the vote is cast. Um, you theoretically could do that with a multi signer list, but uh, the way we envisioned it is that uh, the exact same governance hook that's installed in, on the Genesis account, the, the layer one table, would also be installed on the layer two account. So the so an account sits at a seat at the layer one table, and that account itself has the exact same hook again installed as in the layer one table. And then uh, the layer two participants that sit at that table use that same hook, but on their own account there uh, to ta basically tally votes. And then when they get to a threshold of two thirds, then it raises the TT invoke back to the Genesis account. All right, thank you. Yeah, this is a question. Uh, it's a broad question, but it's for Scott and uh, Evernote. Or um, It's um, from the Evernote community, and they basically ask, um, what can the Evernote community do uh, to further uh, bootstrap uh, Evernote and uh, help you guys uh, bootstrap it? So um, the first thing you could do is run the host on Betanet. Um, the second thing you can do is read through the SDK and start playing around with deploying uh, dApps to the Betanet. Um, and the third thing you can do is to join the community Discord that I think Vet and Wojake uh, host um, and start contributing your ideas about what you would like to see what you would like to see happen. Um, there's uh, there's some talk at the moment of a hackathon, um, and I'm actually talking to some people at Ripple about trying to piggyback off one of their events or something of that order to try and organise uh, an event of that nature. Um, it's, you know, to be honest at the moment, it's been, since 2018, it's been quite a long journey, and I'm... I'm focused on on ensuring that the team has everything ready for launch, um, and I, I I get it. It's fantastic that we've got people, particularly like Wojak, who keeps on prodding me for things that we could or should be doing. Um, and I, I love that that people want to see it exist to that extent. Um, but you know, the, the team is is working really hard just to deliver. Um, the, the main meat um, and everything else will have to follow the what I would what I would absolutely love uh, we are going to soon release um, a, a a bulletproof version of our nomad contract so we had previously um, demoed an example of an evernode contract that wanders the network that that shuts down a node 
and goes and finds itself another node to host on and, and purchases a slot on that host and pays for it and then shuts down another node. So it's a self-replicating contract. Um, the one thing that we we would love is someone to pick up our EVM project and run with it, particularly someone who's got more EVM experience. So what we demoed was a toy version of an EVM contract running on um, on Evernode where um, it, it's a contract and you could upload your Solidity code, your compiled Solidity code to it, and hey, presto, your, um, you would be able to completely just cut and paste your project from Solidity and have it run as an Evernode contract. Um, it's it's in our Git rehub, uh, GitHub. It's um, it's open source. It's free to anyone to play with. It'd be fantastic to see that uh, launch because you know we can do it. it. It's it's not a thing that is beyond Evernode to to run EVM code um, in a cut and paste format. That would be fantastic. Other than that, jump jump on the Discord. What what really helps my team is seeing, you know, there are three guys in Sri Lanka uh, from a former client of mine when I was a lawyer, and um, they uh, they really get excited from seeing people build on what they've built. So the more we do that, the better. Awesome. What well, Bojek, do you want to uh, comment on this from uh, from your side because you're so engaged in, in the community there? Yeah, man. It's been a pleasure working with uh, uh, Richard Holland, Scott Chamberlain on the Evernote side of things, and especially the dev team. They've been very, very collaborative on the development part. Uh, they've taken a part. Uh, they've taken into account of the community's comments and their contributions. It's been uh, validated that they've done a great job at developing Hot Pocket and, of course, the hosting marketplace in the form of a hook. Their hook is very interesting. I, I'd like to say that uh, since uh, Evernote relies on the XRP ledger to maintain a decentralized uh, network uh, for the platform, essentially, uh, to maintain the registry or the list of active hosts on the ecosystem. And, of course, it's being used to process process payments in a tr trustless and decentralized manner. So anyone could join in as a host and start providing hosting services at top of Evernote. And, and to comment on the hook part, uh, there are three hooks right now that uh, Evernote is developing and will be launching, uh, which are the registry hook, which maintains the list of hosts. There's the governance hook, which will maintain the governance game on Evernote. And there is also the heart, heartbeat hook uh, meant to be used internally for hosts to keep up, uh, to update their status on Evernote. Uh, uh, either they are online or not, essentially. And I'd like to see Scott or Richard uh, to talk about it more, I guess. Uh, which particular, do you mean the heartbeat hook or... The hook in general? Uh, the hook in general, but I'd like to emphasize on the governance game, really. Um, so our governance game hook, I don't think we've released all the details of how that's meant to work, but it's it's somewhat similar. Um, the idea is the network is, uh, it all comes down to the hook and you can replace your hook with a new hook by a vote from all um, validators who hold a registration NFT and have done so for the last three months. Um, and it's uh, like much like the XRPL voting, it's 80% of those who are eligible to vote voting in favour of a new hook um, for a two-week period. Yeah, so, about. so just to be clear, the Evernote hooks will be installed on a Blackhold account. So that Blackhold account will issue Evers according to the logic inside those hooks. and uh, But that's essentially immutable. So to allow for an upgrade pathway, if there's a bug or the community wants a new feature or so on, uh, the Evernote hosts, the people who are supplying um, hardware to the network essentially, can get together and if 80% of them agree, then they can actually replace the, the hook on that account or one of the hooks on that account. 
with uh, a, a new version that has new features or fixes a bug or whatever. I think Wojcik um, is about to open a kind of worms with that one because that's a, a super interesting talk, topic and probably needs like um, kind of its own uh, space because otherwise we're just going to sit here for another four hours to discuss that. So um, I suggest, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a topic I, I guess a lot of people would like to talk about. So maybe you guys can schedule a space and, and, and flash that out. So because um, we're a bit limited on the time. So I hate to cut you off. Um, so so I think what, what I would add is the governance game, we, there's, a, there's a lot of legal restrictions on how we structure the governance game. Um, and there's a very good reason why validators are the ones that participate and not users as a whole. And that is the validators are the ones that are... The tokens on the network get issued to validators because they're the ones providing the services of the network. And, you know, so that we don't end up in all kinds of legal problems, um, they're also the ones, therefore, that vote on replacing hooks. Um and that that won't that won't ever change. And there's no point discussing that. Okay. Um, as a as a final question or the final two questions I would like to raise. Um, actually, it's three. Um, maybe can Wita, maybe Wita can answer two of them in one shot. So uh, a, a pressing question or interesting question is that people want to know what hooks will be available um, at launch and then where do people go to stay up to date for hooks as well as Evernote? Maybe Scott can start and then we're going to have Wietzer closing this off. Um, so, well, yeah, sorry, uh, sure. The, so, the hook, go, go. go ahead. <laughs> let's, have, let's have Scott first and then sure. we're going to do Wietzer. So, Evernode, we use we use our Twitter account to update everyone on what's happening with Evernode. Um, there is a very bare bones website that was designed by yours truly, um, which is why it looks so rubbish. Um, and it will be replaced by a new website once we go live. When we go live, there'll be a website that will be controlled by the Evernode Foundation. Um, that will be a not-for-profit incorporated in Australia. It doesn't exist yet because there's no way you want to incorporate a new public entity before you have a reason for it to exist. Um, so it's the Twitter account is the main way to be updated on what's happening with Evernode and joining Wojake's Discord, Evernode Discord is the best way to be involved in conversations surrounding Evernode. Thanks. Yeah, Witzer, gonna bring us out. Yeah, five five hooks companion by XApps on launch. There's the savings hook, which is of course automatic saving on in our outgoing incoming or outgoing transactions. There's the firewall hook that will allow you to, uh, for example, block memo low value memo spam transactions into your account and prevent prevent yourself from uh, sending uh, 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 way too high amounts to uh, to other accounts without a, uh, a double check or time delay. There's the direct debit hook that I really like where you can authorize another account to direct debit into your account with a max amount per time interval. So think about think uh, getting a coffee on the train platform every workday. Uh, you just authorize the uh, uh, the coffee corner to direct debit the coffee from your account, which which allows you to get a tap and go experience with with non in a in a self custodial environment. And uh, uh, the payment uh, payment watchdog I just mentioned that under the firewall actually the payment watchdog will. Uh, uh, prevent transactions going out of your account if the value is too high, for example, where you get a time delay that you can configure, and then you have to reconfirm your transaction, which which give you gives you time to reconsider, and it also gives you time to, for example, uh, make sure your funds or your account is safe again if a third party gets access to your key if your key is compromised because they cannot move it all out at the same time. Uh, and then, and the final one is going to be the the governance hook that lives on the network, of course. And we're going to uh, create an accompanying uh, 
XApp as well, so people can can see who the governance participants are, what their votes are, things like that. Great. Best resources to stay up to date, folks. I would say the Twitter account, our Twitter account, and if there's anything um, uh, significant. It's going to be on the XRPL Labs blog, of course, like the security audit, things like that. But I, uh, I, I tend to tweet every now and then with updates. It's uh, not really structured data, but I would say it's the, it's, it's the best channel if you also want to see the, the, the smaller advancements. And, and, and now that Richard is also back, maybe he, he will also tweet the one yeah. other tweet. <laughs> yep. I wouldn't count on uh, it, but, but maybe. <laughs> Great. Okay, guys, uh, we're a bit over the time. Um, so I would say um, thanks for everyone attending this nice space. If you still have an additional question, just keep sending them on Twitter. We're going to tag the right people. Um, maybe Jake or Scott can set up a different call if there are a lot of um, Evernote questions. And I think that's it for today. Fantastic. Okay, thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. Cheers.